then I think we are all set. So now everybody can follow this uh, this section, I think. Um, we're going to have uh, then a few a few words about mega trends and uh, and key drivers. Um, we have a trend towards glo globalization of consumption and production structures, which uh, we know that uh, there is an increasingly, uh, let's say, focus on division of labor around the globe, where uh, nations like China, Korea, and formerly it was uh, Japan who took over some of the production activities that used to take place in the United States and in Europe. And that has to do with uh, a lot of things. It may have to do with the regulations, as we discussed um, during the last, last section. And it has to do with labor costs. So the, so the relative costs of the production factors, including natural resources, is, uh, is, is a key driver for this, uh, this, uh, this trend. Come back to this a bit later on. Increasingly deregulated transport systems, <coughs> meaning that there I even if I, I mentioned a few remaining regulations, like uh, cabotage regulations, which we'll talk more about later on, but the deregulation uh, allows for, a, let's say, a more frictionless transport system, where um, uh, big international transport companies can do their business uh, and not without regulations, because that is not true, but with far less regulation that's than it used to be. For instance, uh <coughs> within, the, within the shipping industry, we, we used to have liner conferences where uh, the big shipping companies were allowed to talk together to set prices, fr freight rates. Uh, and uh, at least freights now to and from Europe, uh, that is not allowed for anymore. So, so they need to compete. And uh, according to, to, to economic theory, uh, under certain circumstances, competition is a good thing because it lowers prices. I said under certain circumstances. Uh, and I think I, I would like to ask you about that a bit. Uh <coughs> what is the main, or m mention two main characteristics or uh, assumptions or presumptions that needs to be in place for a market to work uh, efficiently? in a situation where you have free competition, where you have competitive markets. Two assumptions for a working competitive <coughs> markets. Maybe price and quality? Yeah, you can say that competition affects price and perhaps also quality. But for the competition to work properly, because we all know that I mean, politicians and, uh, and even researchers and uh, people talk about competition. That is a very good thing because <coughs> then you, need, you will be on your toes all the time and will produce better, uh, offer better products to the market to a lower price and all that. And then I said, well, in many cases it's true, but I want you to give me then two main assumptions for that statement to <coughs> actually be true. Two assumptions for a working competitive market, yes? A certain amount of buyers and suppliers? Yeah. You need to have a certain number of players in the market. <coughs> because if there are one player in the market that can offer products, 
you have a monopoly. So then you have no competition. <coughs> if you have two or perhaps three, you have a very limited number. And you might have, may have something that within economics is called an oligopoly. Write it up. And they can also, as we see uh, in the monopolistic market, be able to control quite a lot of, of the activity. And they can, under certain circumstances, be well able to set prices and quantities offered to the market. So there is a limit on, on competition. So you need to have a certain number of, of players. The second assumption. Uh, maybe a demand of uh, this product? Yeah. Of course, you, you need to have you need to have the demand and <laughs> I can f you also need to have more than one player on the demand side as well because you have if you have only one player on the demand side which is also the case in some markets <coughs> you will not have much competition then you, then things gets a bit stuck but i was thinking about another assumption for a for let's say an international market to be competitive which is often violated in the transport sector <coughs> No thoughts? No, no thoughts are too stupid to be mentioned in this room. I will not laugh at you, I promise. And nobody else should, should either, because this is complex. And the, as you said, they cannot communicate with, uh, to have the same prices. Mm -hmm. So um, what we are uh, then talking about is uh, a free information flow <coughs> could be one one important aspect that that people are informed about <coughs> other players activities yes but i was not that is also one it's an important issue There is a correlation between the price and the amount, the number of... Yeah. There is often a correlation about um, between, between the price level and the number of suppliers in certain industries. But okay, I'll, I, will, I will mention what I I'm thinking about. It's the two assumptions, I will write them up. It is... Uh, <coughs> sufficient, number of sufficient number of suppliers <coughs> and um, what I called free entry and exit in the market. So that you could have new newcomers coming in all the time to offer their their uh, their products or services to the market. So that there's enough number of players, and that they can they can establish themselves mm -hmm. in the market, and also then that people can exit the market if they like, if if they need to or want to. Just reflect a bit upon this because it's 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 important. Um, 
If you now consider a typical transportation business in this international transport chain, you can consider, let's say, uh, a shipping company. A shipping company, they need, of course, to, to they need some ships to, to, to operate. They need uh, staff to operate them, both onshore and on board. They need perhaps to, to have agreements with uh, ports. Uh, which entails a lot, uh, or at least some, fixed costs connected to, let's say, the practicalities with respect to running the service. So we can say that a shipping company, they have the characteristics of being, um, they need initial investments which is <coughs> ships uh, systems agreements and what have you so we can call that let's say the initial investments here to, to be able to to move one container from A to B. We call that for term that I0. It's just an, it's a number of certain magnitude. And then you have uh, <laughs> the volume of freight. Call well, we call it Q quantity, and we have uh, costs per shipment. Per shipment which we can call C. And then we can set up a <coughs> formula here based on these three variables, which is uh, <coughs> we can set up a formula giving the average costs of, of a given container that is going to be shipped from A to B. So the average cost, I use this, this, uh, this line here to term <coughs> this the average cost, which then will be able to, uh, will be equal to the initial investments. And then we need to add <coughs> the cost per shipment times the volume of freight or number of containers, if you like. So we get the C as a function of volume times the volume. And if you think about it, shipping one container on board a ship or shipping let's say if you consider the first container <coughs> or the 12th container going from A to B <coughs> the costs <coughs> per container can be considered as fairly equal so the costs per shipment times um, per container times number of container this is constant and this is of course varying <coughs> with the number of containers and then you divide the whole thing 
by <coughs> the number of containers. Then we get the average costs per <coughs> container. And we can add in a queue here for com completeness. <coughs> I have an idea by showing you this now, but just to make sure that I'm not totally lost on the wrong field here. But I can just say that if this the, the variable cost per container as a function of the number of containers shipped, shipped is fairly constant. We can draw this as a, as a line like this. As long as you have available ca capacity on board, this curve will be a constant line. So this is the C as a function of Q. At the investment costs, you have to buy the ship, you have to set up the systems and, uh, and everything might be a quite <coughs> high number. So for the first container shipped, if this is container number one, and this is <coughs> uh, average costs per container, First container is extremely expensive because it needs to cover also all the investment costs. So you have an incentive to increase volume here to get the average costs down. So this curve will then look something like this. So as the number of containers shipped increases, the average costs will go down in this market. At one point in time, the ship is full. And uh, as when the ship, li a ship like that, approaches its uh, capacity limit, the, the, the loading and unloading starts to get a bit more messy and then the unit costs may start to increase somewhere like something like that and suddenly it goes straight up because then the ship is full and as long as you consider one ship here it will uh, look something <coughs> like this. So these curves will, will develop in this pattern. But what I'm saying here is that the size of the market matters. And the size of the ships carrying containers also matters. Because if you study <coughs> cost functions like this for a small <coughs> container ship like that one, as compared to a big one, the scale effects, as I have tried to illustrate here, is even bigger for a larger ship. So there is an incentive here for the ship owners, at least those involved in, uh, in, uh, in deep sea transport, going uh, into continental container transports, to increase the magnitude of the ships. And then, we are in a situation where you don't have necessarily free entry and exit anymore because so much capital is needed to invest in those big ships. So there is a tendency, at least in some of the international transport markets, that only a few players will be left because of this, uh, these scale effects. They, uh, they obtain a large share of the market, and there are very few of them because they have accumulated capital, knowledge, and everything during a long period of time, and it's not easy for others to, to, to come in. 
and, 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 uh, and provide the necessary competition. So that is one. When, when I, 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 I present these simple points, there is a lot <coughs> of things going on behind the scene here, or behind the, let's say, the rather <coughs> easy and self-explained expressions that are on the, black, black on, the, on the screen here now. Deregula deregulation, yes. Uh, you can uh, you can deregulate, let's say, the international container transport system, and every everybody might think that you get a lot of ships like this, smaller ships, and a lot of competition. But when you deregulate, you might instead get a lot of containers, but on board a very f limited number of ships, which are big, and owned by a very limited number of, uh, of companies. So deregulation may, in some circumstances, when you have large, let's say, lev uh, large degree of asset specificity, high initial investments, you may end up with market concentration. And those uh, those guys running this uh, this uh, business could easily earn quite a lot of money. Uh, <coughs> so, the globalization um, of consumption and production structures, the production structure. I have tried to discuss that a bit here now with respect to deep sea container shipping. And you will have more about this uh, later on in the course, but just to give you a taste of some of the discussions that we will, uh, will undertake here. Enhanced productivity in international supply chains goes together with using um, labor where the labor is cheapest, try to exploit <coughs> the competitive advantage of of each country around the globe, each region around the globe, where we have this division now, where um, China, Korea, other countries in East Asia are doing quite a lot of production, uh, often labor-intensive production, but not necessarily only labor-intensive production, whereas some of the more automatic, automated production is still taking place in Europe, and even in the in this high-cost country. Uh, Norway. So all this specialization, global specialization that takes place entails a very s a substantial growth in world trade levels and related transport volumes. So I have said some of this, uh, this already, but uh, it boils down to, to this. Uh, products that were sourced locally or regionally, they are now transported around the world. Very simple products. If you buy this, uh, uh, in, Norway, in Norway we have something that you can buy in the canteen uh, called Gunmorn. <coughs> it's a, con a small container in plastic containing yogurt and some cereals which you can eat. I have not updated myself on the transport structure of that uh, product. But I think it used to be like this. <coughs> the, the, the grains were uh, produced somewhere in Europe. The yogurt was, at some point in time at least, produced in Greece. And the whole thing was produced, I mean the, the cereals and the yogurt <coughs> was contained in Belgium and then shipped back to Norway for sale. 
So even this very small, simple thing that you can buy for, uh, I don't know what it costs, 20 kroner or something, has been on a trip around Europe to end up here. Due to specialization, comparative advantages, and rather, let's say, cheap transportation. And when I say cheap transportation, that is also something that can be um, discussed. Because um, transport services in, a, in, a, in an efficiency perspective, when you even take the environment into consideration, <coughs> the cost function of transport, and then I'm talking m about this C here, needs to take into account also the costs of emission to water, to, s to, to soil, to air, and the, uh, and the true cost of energy use, and that has to more or less to do with emissions to air. So those needs to be included in the cost function as well. And you can easily integrate it here by saying that, well, if the costs of carbon dioxide emissions are not included in the, in, the, in the international transport, the cost of international transport services. Because, let's say, international, let, for instance, international deep sea container shipping is not a part of the quota trading system for carbon emissions. That's a long story, which we'll come back to. But the bottom line is that they don't pay the full costs when you take the environmental issues into consideration. It can easily be in included in this, uh, in this scheme by shifting this cost function upwards <coughs> when adding the environmental costs. And by doing that, I also need to shift this average cost curve upwards because of this expression, right? So you shift the whole cost function upwards. And if I, in addition now, <coughs> to make this perhaps a bit clearer, introduces demand for transport services, I can introduce a demand curve here in this scheme which could look something like this. This is demand. And it is, uh, it is skewed like this because when, when you increase costs, the quantity will decrease. So let's say in this case, if the price of transportation was set equal to the average cost, which means that the ship owner in this case gets cost coverage. And that's, that makes sense, because otherwise they go broke. They go broke. So this is the initial <coughs> amount of containers that are moved with the initial average cost curve. If you, in, uh, if you include carbon taxes to correct for the costs of emissions to air to avoid global warming or reduce global warming, we see that because we now have shifted the cost curves, Q1, the amount of containers that are moved 
are slightly reduced from Q1, sorry, from Q0 to Q1. So this is how we can, when, when you, this, this is meant to be straight down, I mean, I, yeah, you get my point, anyway. So when the ship owners and uh, customers of transportation services are fighting against including carbon taxes in uh, international transport services. This is the reason why prices go up. So this will be, this will then be the prices. This is P, P0, the price before the carbon tax, and this is the price after, after the carbon tax is imposed in this market. So we get higher prices, we get lower quantities, and nobody would like to have that as uh, if, if, if you are running a business. But, and this is not a tax to let the government earn a lot of money from this, but it is a tax to correct the market for costs that are imposed on let's say, the global society, because the emissions are uh, likely to cause problems in the longer run connected to global warming. So when we talk about um, this point, which is true, the Gomorn thing is uh, transported all around uh, Europe. Some of them some of the costs there are, are uh, covered by carbon taxes, but not all. But we need to, as we are going, as academics within this business, when we are going to discuss international transport and uh, international trade and, uh, and all the nice results from that, we also need to take the costs into consideration in a proper way to, let's say, reduce some of the transportation around the world, uh, which we do when we introduce carbon emission costs into the cost function of the transport companies, and hence also into the production function of the customers. or vice versa. <laughs> I mean, you introduce it into the production function of the shipping companies and into the cost function of the, of the, of the customers here. Is this reasonably clear? <coughs> yes? No? <laughs> well, I continue then. Um, <coughs> Enablers of globalization, <coughs> um, and that's this is uh, this is also important. We we are talking about some critical things that needs to be in place to 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 have this globalization, uh, this globalized activities take place. Information technology to let the information flow uh, go as quick and uh, comprehensive as, as needed. Um, convergence of consumer tastes, tastes. That has to do with economies of scale. That if you, if you have a global, let's say, a global preference for microwave ovens, that every, every household should have a make microwave oven, to, to, as an example. It's easier than to set up large units to produce them, and it's easier to, s to set up large transport companies to transport them. Because then you have 
let's say you, it's possible to have <coughs> a large number of units that can be handled in a standardized way, and you can you can actually exploit the economies of scale by investing in handling equipment and big ships and big factories, <coughs> and you can get this structure like this. So the, the, the example of microwave ovens is not, it's not totally taken out of the air because there are very few producers of microwave ovens around the world. You may see a lot of brands, but they are produced in a very limited number of factories. <coughs> and that has to do with the economies of scale that I have tried to illustrate here. Capital is flowing <coughs> freely to where the return on <coughs> invested capital is, is at the highest. You have uh, the frictionless uh, yet aviation travel, which is also important when it comes to freight, but it's even more important when it comes to people. So to do business, you need to talk to people, you need to make contacts in certain cultures, you need to perhaps go there, go to, the, to, to your customers uh, on a number of times to build confidence, to understand the culture, and to do business. And without easy ways of doing that, it's much more difficult to, to have a globalized uh, business structure. Containerization of world trade. Talked a bit about container ships. And that was the big revolution in the, in the 1960s uh, that allowed for unified freight carriers, which could be loaded on ships, on trucks, on rail, even, uh, even on aircraft, and which makes it easier to have a seamless uh, international transport system. So containerization, on which, uh, which will be dealt with in a, in a few weeks, in more in detail, is a very important. And the two transport modes are and ships and, and, uh, and air transport. Uh, we have also a kind of, there, there is also a, a strand of thought around this international transport issue, which has to do with loca uh, localization and localization theory. And we, we, have, a, a, we have a separate course in, uh, in localization theory at, at this college. But just a few <coughs> elements is that uh, transport hubs, which is, you can, you can consider a, a big transport terminal or a big warehouse, in Norway, we have the, the main transport hub is loca uh, located outside Oslo, capitalizes on large local markets. <coughs> so it, is, uh, it's, uh, it can be, if you calculate transport costs, which of course is dependent on distance, it is often good to locate the hub close to the, end, the market for the end users. And then, close to a bigger city or bigger cities. The hubs, warehouses, transport terminals, they have also the characteristics of economies of scale. So the bigger the terminal, of course there are limits to growth everywhere, but up to a certain point at least, the unit costs per shipment is reduced with the number of items moved within this hub. So there are scale effects there as well. You can just pay attention to that uh, right away. That scale effects, economies of scale, increasing returns to scale, the, these are synonymous um, expressions, is a, is a backbone when we talk about the economics of international transportation, scale effects, 
big up to a certain extent, <coughs> certain amount, is, is kind of beautiful here <coughs> in terms of reducing unit costs. You also have the hubs, let's say, along the way then from, uh, for instance, um, Eastern Asia and on the way to Europe or the United States, where you have intermediate hubs located, for instance, at, uh, at important intersections. If you take cargo from various sources, you have the hub, you consolidate it, meaning that you pack it together into larger units of shipment. You, you cross dock, meaning that all units going to a certain destination is taking from, taken from all the inbound flows, packed together and shipped out, for instance, to Oslo or San Francisco or Rotterdam or wherever. So we combine goods going to the same destination, but which uh, arrives from various origins. And uh, <coughs> those intermediate hubs are located at strategic points where the there is a kind of a cost minimizing procedure going on here. You locate the hubs to exploit the economies, the economies of scale connected to consolidation cross docking. And of course you can you can influence as a regulator the location of such hubs. And uh, you don't have a global regulator of international transport services, but a given location can compete with other locations by offering cheap land, because these hubs, they, they consume quite a lot of land. So uh, let's say uh, the owner of land around a port can offer this land for a very low price to the port authorities so that they can expand. And when they expand, you can have cost patterns like this. So, they, so the authorities around uh, the port of Seebrugge in, in Belgium they made a strategic choice, uh, let's say 10, 15 years back, to offer a lot of cheap land to the port so that they could expand their activities connected to, to the import of cars to Europe. And they have been successful. So the Japanese car manufacturer Toyota, which sells a lot of cars in, in, in Europe, they use Zebrig as their main the main uh, <coughs> port of entry into Europe. And then you have you may have competition between hubs because because of these effects you may also have concentration at the hubs where let's say one specific car brand can integrate with the port and say that we will have access to everything as long as you keep all the others out. <coughs> if you can uh, enter into a deal on that one, we can, uh, we can integrate ourselves. In, in, in we can have done do some agreements. And then you have a kind of a monopoly situation at one hub. And then others will do the same at other hubs. And you have a kind of a competition, anyway, between hubs. So this will also be discussed in a, in a, in a separate lecture. The regulation. I will uh, stop there, I think, and just uh, continue with that one in the, in the final, final section of this lecture. So we break again for around 15 minutes. <coughs>